I hope that it has been a good few weeks as we have been preparing for Christmas in this season of Advent. I know it has been helpful for me. Uh, it helps me to name what is important, what we've been looking at. Uh, we begin everything with worship, that we, in worship we tell the story of, of Jesus, uh, that is the center of this. That in, in worship we find peace and joy and, and connect to that story, that uh, we need to spend less of ourselves and, and push back against all that impinges upon our, our time, our, our uh, calendars, our checkbooks during these seasons, uh, that we need to give in a way that's relational, as we talked about last week, giving in a way that has the with of God with us, and uh, simple but, but helpful. This last Sunday of Advent, this is, uh, confusingly enough, it is the last Sunday of Advent this morning, and then tonight is Christmas Eve. Uh, so this, tonight uh, we come to the last part of this, as to love all. It's the part that should be most obvious because, well, think about what we sing. Joy to the... The Lord has come, let earth receive her king, let... Every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature, right? That we sing it every year, and it's a big old display of that this is for all. Go tell it on the mountains, go tell it on the mountains over the hills and... Right? This is good news for all. It, it's, this, uh, it's important to celebrating Advent well, and it's not something I had honestly put a lot of thought into uh, before leading worship myself. I realized, ah, this really is. This does have to be good news for, for all. It is at such moments when we need to be reminded that uh, we have the lives of the saints. The saints are not mystical, wonderful do-gooders that are perfect in every way. What a saint is, a saint is someone who has followed Jesus and read Scripture well, and we look at how they did it, and we say, Ah, I can do that too. They got it right, and they get it right, and we look at them, and, and we can say we can do the same thing. And so there's a saint who helps us remember how to celebrate Christmas well. His name is uh, Nicholas of Mira. Mira, which is a small town in modern-day Turkey. The guy was born 1,700 years ago to Epiphanes and Johanna. His uh, parents died of the plague, which is unfortunate, uh, but they also left him an inheritance. He then goes off to be raised by his uncle, also confusingly enough named Nicholas, and uh, his uncle was the bishop of the nearby port town of Patara. And it is amusing that... Um, the bishop at the time, the bishop of any area, was the pastor of the first church. So is this the oldest church in Shalbina? If this is the oldest, if indeed this is the oldest church of Shalbina, according to the ancient logic, I am the bishop of Shalbina. <laughs> I'll put that on my card. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to claim the title, but that's how it worked. If you were the pastor of the, the first church, you were the bishop. And so Nick was raised by his uncle, the bishop, Nick. And the reason we remember him are the stories that are, arose around what he did with the money he inherited. He uh, found out about a family that had, uh, th there were three daughters, and they had no money for a dowry. Uh, for any parents, you get to pay for your daughter's wedding. I mean, that's expensive, right? It was worse than if you couldn't pay for a dowry it wasn't not that they wouldn't have a big wedding it's that they just wouldn't get married and a single female a single woman in those days if they if she could not didn't have a dowry and could not be married then she was going to be destitute she would not be brought into a family she would not have anyone to provide for her and she would end up as a beggar and so bishop nicholas uh, found out about this family, three daughters, and he took a, a chunk of his inheritance, literally a ball of solid gold, and the night before the eldest turned of marriageable age, he walked by the house and tossed a chunk of gold into a ball of gold and through the window. And they wake up in the morning and, aha, I can get married now, I'm not going to be a beggar, and oh, this is a good thing. The second daughter comes of age, he does the same thing. He takes another chunk of his inheritance, a, gold, a ball of solid gold, and throws it in the window. The third time, the father of the three daughters understands what the pattern is, and so he stays up that night. 
to watch and figure out, I mean, you don't want to say no, but you want to at least say thank you. And so Bishop Nicholas, being a, being a somewhat spry fellow, is able to climb the roof and drop it down the chimney where it lands in their stockings, where it has been, they've been hung by the fire to dry. And so they wake up in the morning, they can't find the ball of gold until they go and they put their socks on. And oh, there's a ball of gold in my sock. That's confusing. And then she can get married. And so Bishop uh, Nicholas of Mira ends up being uh, seen and understood to be a saint. And so he is Saint Nicholas of Mira, whose uh, symbol, whose icon are three balls of gold where he used what he had to love all, especially those most in need. And so if you ever wanted to know about the first Saint Nick, that'd be it, Saint Nicholas of Mira. What Nick realized was he was helping the families that were just like the ones that Jesus was born into. Mary and Joseph were born, uh, were a family in desperate need, uh, just as much as his father with the three daughters. Jesus could have been born to any family, literally, right? any family. And uh, God chose, chooses to bless the family that is desperately poor in a community of people that is subjugated and ignored. Take, let's just take a moment to... Look at Mary and Joseph from the point of view of how, what you'd see if you were their, their neighbors. Right? They show up looking for a place to stay, and they knock on the door, and, and here is a pregnant woman, and, and she's about and she's very pregnant. Like, my mom got, someone rear-ended my mom once when she was like nine months pregnant. She got out of the car, turned around, and the guy who was rather angry looked at her and said, it's all my fault, I'm, I'm at fault, right? I mean, you put a pregnant woman in danger, and, and like, everyone just goes, I'm at fault, you're right, whatever. Like, that's what happens. And for, some, for them to knock on the door, and, and, that, and the in, innkeeper not to even ask, hey, is there... Is there someone who might give up their bed for this woman? Right? What, what type of person would knock on the... How would they be seen? What's the social thing going on here such that, they, that when they knock, no one is willing? Right? What, what's happening with that? You, you look a little bit further and you see who visits the child. The... the the shepherds. Now, a shepherd is a shepherd because they can't be trusted with any other job. Like, the, the comparison I could best make is, what's the one thing you could put on, on an application for a job that makes it hardest for you to get that job? What's the one box you would check? Have you been convicted of a felony? Right, you check that box and God help you if you ever, if you ever, get, ever get a job again. Like, that's what the shepherds are. They're the people who had to mark, I have been convicted of a felony. And so that's why they're shepherds, because it's an easy job. You count the number of sheep at the end of the night, and if it equals the number at the end, you still have a job, and if it doesn't, you're fired. And so when, when the shepherds come knocking on the door, right, if, if, if shepherds or folks like the shepherds had knocked on the door when, when Olivia had just had, uh, when we had just had our, our child, Let's be honest. I'll be honest. If someone like that had knocked on my door, I would not have said, oh, come on into the hospital room. Right? You say, well, I'll be out in a minute. Let me see you in the waiting room. And, and yet Joseph welcomes them in. What does that tell you about the type of folk that Joseph and Mary are comfortable around? Right? Again, this social, there's a, a, a cultural thing. There's a social thing going on here. They are people who are down and out. They're in trouble. Mary and Joseph, they go to make an offering at the temple. Everyone makes an offering at the temple to, when you have your firstborn child in the Jewish faith. And so what do you offer? You offer a lamb. You're redeeming your firstborn. It goes back to the Exodus. When the, the last plague, when the firstborn child dies, what do they do? They mark the, the, the top of the door with lamb's blood to, to protect their child, to claim their child back from God. And so you offer a lamb as your offering. Except if you're dirt poor. If you're absolutely dirt poor, you offer two doves. And that's what they offer. They are so poor they cannot make the right offering. Like, that's like, you hear people who can't come to church because they don't have clothes. To I mean, this is like cultural isolation. They don't, they show up to the temple and they, they make their offering amongst all the other mothers who are offering the lambs. And they have their two doves. This is a sad and hard moment. 
This is a family that, as far as I can tell, is on the margins of society. A family that's not respectable, it's not accepted, it's not seen as good people. At the very first Christmas, the very first gift are given to the people who are most down and out. St. Nicholas knew this, that Christmas is good news to all, but that all especially begins with the ones who are most in need. Now, to put this a different way, if you are going to write your, Christmas, your birthday shopping list for, for Jesus, what does he ask, right? If you're going to love all, where do you begin? In Matthew 25, we hear, food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, hospitality for the stranger, clothes for those without, care for the sick, company for the prisoner. Right? And we're doing one of those today, for which I'm very thankful. As we've been talking about, this is the way, this is, uh, the way we, we love all this month. Um, this is our opportunity. Every dollar that goes in here goes towards uh, buying water filters for families who are thirsty and, and who need clean water. And, and so I'm very thankful we're doing this. Oh, and over the coming months, we're going to continue to grapple with this. During the season of Lent, we'll be looking at how do we help and serve? How do we love all in a way that is effective and faithful and graceful? Um, how do we do that as a practice that is ongoing? But I think it's good to remember today, before we start opening the plethora of gifts from each other, from family, from friends, uh, that we make sure we remember that the first what the gift that is given is a gift given to all, and that gift is first unwrapped by the ones who are most in need. May we remember that, and if we forget it, may we look at the first Saint Nick who might remind us. Amen.